Thank you for listening to the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast with hosts Clara and Jimmy Hinton. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe and share so you never miss an episode. Search for us on your favorite podcast app, or you can find the podcast on jimmyhinton.org and findingahealingplace.com. Please rate our show, subscribe, and share so we can spread the word. If you would like to support us and get exclusive rewards, go to patreon.com slash speaking out. Find a tier that best fits you and join as a patron of the podcast. Now let's get into the show. Welcome to this week's podcast with host Jimmy Hinton. And Jimmy's mom, Clara. Thank you to our patrons who make this podcast possible. We always give you an extra special thank you, um, not just for the monetary gifts that you give us, but for the encouraging words that you give us every week. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you for sharing this podcast. Let's continue to spread the word. So here's a question for this week. Should our schools be teaching Abuse 101 to our kids? Um, Kind of an interesting question. I am a huge proponent of this, if it's taught right. And I am too, if it's taught right by the right people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I I think a lot of people – this conversation comes up a lot in advocacy circles. And uh, a lot of people say, well, we, you know, we had somebody come in and they taught good touch to bad touch. And I say, okay, well, how long was this – presentation well I, it was just an assembly it was you know right. a 10 minute or 15 right. minute talk on good touch bad touch that's not what we're talking about um that is not no. adequate that's not enough um and abusers find ways to get around good touch bad touch anyway um there are very intentional ways my dad wrote about it in letters to me from prison mm-hmm. where he challenged um, finding kids that were trained by good touch, right. bad touch, and he would go in and uh, produce victims. So, uh, yeah, we're talking about education, uh, really teaching our kids about the dynamics of abuse and abusers, techniques that they use, uh, how to listen to their bodies and know when they feel uncomfortable. Um, and then as they get older, um, age appropriate, of course, how do they develop uh, a proper vocabulary uh, to really understand uh, what abuse is and that they're being abused? Um, I think that's so important, Jimmy, because um, chances are nine out of 10, a child has no idea when they're being abused, number one, yeah. until it's much later, until trauma has taken place and mm-hmm. and they realize, hey, this was really wrong. By then, they're so ashamed and embarrassed and self-blaming and all the yeah. things that go with it that they don't know what to do with this pain. And number three, they really don't know where to go, where a safe place is to go to talk about it. So uh, I think the education component would really resolve a lot of those issues. Yeah. Well, that's a, I mean, that's a huge element, if not the biggest one, is that even if kids do feel uneasy uh, about what's happening to them, you know, if they don't have the vocabulary to describe what's happening, um, most kids don't have a clue who they can talk to um, or what an avenue would be to try to communicate that. So, you know, these are components that are really essential. Um, so yeah, why don't you talk about some, um, reasons that, uh, kids don't get education at home, uh, because, you know, in a family like mine, education at home is, uh, that's where they get educated right. the most, well, uh, when it comes to I'll be abuse honest dynamics. with you, um, a lot of people from my generation were totally embarrassed. Uh, it found it very hard to talk about issues like Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know to talk about abuse but even sex education was really difficult it just wasn't done back in the day now today it's different but with abuse i think there are a majority of parents who think we don't need to talk about this we don't need to open this can of worms Mm -hmm. because number one 
I know my child would come tell me yeah. if anything bad ever happened. Which is a myth. Right. In, in the, Big, ma- the myth majority ever. of cases, biggest children myth. will not no, self-disclose they, for a whole host of reasons. Well, I know that from our family. Yeah. And number two, I think a lot of parents are under the misconception that this will never, ever happen to my child. Mm-hmm. Uh, these things don't happen. To kids like mine, or they don't happen that often. Or they don't happen. Abuse that is kind often. of a fringe thing that happens well, to a handful of people. Well, or I'm always watching my child. My my child is always yeah. with me, or with friends that I trust. It's <clears> not <throat> going to happen. Um, what a sad thing! But I think a lot of parents feel that way. Also, parents are when there's an uncomfortable. Uh, topic a hard topic parents shy away from it i've done that um, yeah we all do it I, with certain you know, we, it, certain it's, subjects it's right it's very hard at any age and especially as kids get older i think it grows increasingly more difficult to talk about things like abuse with a child it shouldn't be that way but it is and so i think it's not not talked about for Christians, I believe that parents naively think their children have been brought to church. So mm-hmm. they understand good from bad. They yep. understand um, evil from, you know, uh, not evil. And they they would get it if something bad was happening to them. Yeah. Children don't. They, di- yeah. they don't. Not with abuse. Abuse is just that different and then there are i think parents who simply refuse to talk about it they're tired of the whole thing i've heard a lot of people say in fact i've i've been told don't you get sick of talking about abuse isn't that a washed out subject now don't you get tired of always bringing it up and because it's yeah a subject that some people simply don't want to hear yeah and you know there's also this notion that me too the me too movement just made people overly paranoid right. and yeah. just that why would you want to instill mm-hmm. that kind of fear in my kid and right. you know make them think that everybody's an abuser so it's all these myths um mm-hmm. and and it's kind of wrapped in fear um i think that's huge to and me, fear and the ignorance fear. Yes. there's fear and ignorance yes. uh, just a lack of knowledge uh, of of real abuse mm-hmm. dynamics and so people really push back against it. Well, and, and the, the type of education that you and I are talking about is not wrapped in fear. No. It's not that kind, you know, uh, that there's um, scary people out there and that they can harm you. Mm-hmm. That's definitely not the way to teach a child about yeah. abuse. So uh, another myth yeah. that needs to be dispelled. So, you know, we have a question, what age would uh, should right. education begin? Um you know, in the home under ideal circumstances, um, you know, about the age of two, uh, you should already be naming uh, body parts by their proper anatomical names. Um, you know, there's a penis, there's a vagina, there's um, the rectum. You know, they have proper terms and, and it's not weird and it's not you know, you're not acting all bizarre about right. it. Um, I, I see so many parents give pet names to body parts. Um, and it just, it teaches your kids from a very young age to be um, both childish in the way they talk about and think about body parts and just um, ignorant, immature, uh, and that that does well, unfortunately it, carry through and it feels uh, puberty weird. and it, beyond. It feels how can um, I'm guilty of the pet names for body parts? I don't know that I ever used proper body parts with your kids because here again, it was never used with me growing up ever. Yeah. In fact, nothing was ever talked about. With I got my sex education out of um, a school class from the nurse mm-hmm. and the encyclopedia. Yeah. Believe it or not, you know, we didn't have internet or anything like that. And from talking with other kids, yeah. but uh, proper terms were never used. Uh, and even just, a, it, you know, a basic understanding of, uh, of you know, what sex is and, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, what's what happens uh, when 
people have sex? Um, how are babies? How are and, babies and born? How are by babies the way, conceived? You're not talking about telling a two year old. No, but, as they as yes, they grow, but it, yeah, yeah it, by age two. That, but 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 I mean, I will say this. You know, my kids from not two years old, but you know, starting at age three, um, they would go on field trips at day at daycare mm-hmm. preschool. Uh, one of the places we went was a farm, and I still remember um, we were at this farm, and I I I was along, and um, one of my kids was maybe four, maybe, and there was a there was a cow that was giving birth. That's awesome. And um, yeah. our kids got to witness mm-hmm. uh, a baby calf being born. Wow. I mean, first you saw the legs come out, wow. and. Um, and then you saw the farmer come over and you know he had to he had to help and he yeah. was explaining to to these mm-hmm. kids not in a in a weird way at all he just he was explaining like this is okay now i have to go and i have to help the mama and mm-hmm. and you're going to see me pull the baby out and then a baby's mm-hmm. going to be born and yeah. our kids watched yeah and it wasn't it's, a big deal yeah. it was like oh you know it's and how, so it's, they learn yeah. they uh, if if you talk to people who grew up on a farm the whole topic of sex, generally speaking, is is not a weird, bizarre. They don't have pet names for parts. Like they just understand because right. they because they see They've it. Been they witness. The sex. Yeah, they yeah. witness with animals the whole birthing process, and it just they they understand. They know because they're out helping dad. And, you and that's know, part of where farm. I got my education. Also, growing up on a little farm, I saw sheep you mm-hmm. know, being yeah. born. I I knew you know, from watching that. And it is, it wasn't strange or odd. Uh -uh. It was just part of life. Right. And you know that I always said with you kids growing up, pets teach us a lot about life. Mm -hmm. And I do believe they do. Yeah. A whole lot about life. And about death. And about I mean, when you have pets that die, that's something that I I see how many people are just, they don't even know how to begin to process a death because they've never even thought about it before. And I'm like, that's that's I mean in my opinion it's one of the most unhealthy things that we can do mm-hmm. for our kids. I mean we we're not morbid in our home but we we talk about death. I mean death is yeah. death is every bit of part, part of life as birth is. It is. And it's just yes. it's a part of that right cycle. It's a part of being on this earth. Um there's birth, um life and there's death. Right. Exactly. So, you know, talking about these things and just having conversations with your kids um I I think is really really appropriate to start with anatomical mm-hmm. names at age two um, by age three as they grow a little bit older maybe then you know uh, talk about childbirth uh, or animal birth if if you don't feel comfortable with childbirth but you know there should be kind of a progression as they as they get older and then as far as curriculum uh, you had mentioned Lauren book yes um, Lauren book from Lauren's kids uh, she's also a senator in the state of Florida. Uh, her curriculum, Safer, Smarter Kids, um, it's phenomenal. I mean, we've used we've used her curriculum uh, at church, mm-hmm. and it is that, really yeah. good. And it begins yeah. with pre-K, and mm-hmm. it goes all the way through 12th grade. And for each grade and each grade group, uh, age group, it's really appropriate for for um, – those kids so you know as they get older a little bit older she goes into talking about um sexting and you know um, online predators that hunt for our kids that's so important because right now we have um so much happening in the world of uh, technology Mm -hmm. with sexting with bullying with um uh people stalking young mm-hmm. people the yeah. whole thing abusing you know and so many uh, young deaths pe- young people taking their lives mm-hmm. because they don't know what to do with all this that's happening yeah and it's devastating it really yeah. is and i keep thinking if proper education had been given maybe that that could have been channeled in a different way mm-hmm. with that child. Maybe. Well, what I like about that curriculum too is it it, it really creates um, kind of a pecking order, and mm-hmm. uh, there's a part of the curriculum is uh, coming up with your I think she calls it your trusted triangle, 
so they, you know, the kids get to choose the three safe awesome. people yeah. who they feel comfortable okay. around, who they right. feel safe around, who have never betrayed them and never made them feel uncomfortable. They get to pick the three adults who are those trusted people and they write it down. You know, they write their trusted triangle down. And then from there, the curriculum talks about this process for how you report to them and, and how you talk to them. But those trusted adults are also trained. You know, they're, they're people who... Oh, there would have to be intense training. They understand yes, right. what their curriculum is about. So, you know, um, we have this question too, who should develop the curriculum? Well, I mean, there's already stuff that's out there. And I, I'm not, I've had people approach me before and ask me if I would be willing to write curriculum for kids. My answer is a big fat no. Um, yeah. I have no interest. Mm -hmm. I, ha I have um, very limited time. And I'm not going to create something that's already been done right. really well. Right. So, you know, I, I, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, in the, in the advocacy community, um, I think for the most part, people are pretty efficient. But I think we could probably even do a little bit better uh, with really networking with people who have have their areas of expertise mm -hmm. and lauren book for her she's an abuse survivor um oh, her story is been phenomenal her and she's and an educator that's yeah. what she went to college for, years for. And years, right? this is her lane right and she's it really yeah. good at it yes um now it was a process for lauren to get this approved yeah for yeah sure. there were tons of hoops so oh yeah it helps that her dad is an attorney i know and, yeah you know and now she's a politician yes. so you know those sorts of things are incredibly helpful but all of those were stepping stones to go to the next level so Absolutely. yeah when started said, very bare bones networking lauren has been more than willing to help others get that first step taken towards getting you know educational pieces yeah into schools and by the way we're not sponsored by safer smarter no. <laughs> kids or by learning no, kids but no. uh, um, it's just it, it's a really good curriculum it really is one thing i was going to interject here is the teaching in the home doesn't always begin that way as you and i were talking about prior to the podcast right? because often there are there is abuse in the home mm -hmm. and there are not uh reputable um good parents uh they're often you know this this just isn't going to happen in the home and that's why it's especially critically important to have curriculum like this mm -hmm. in the schools a child otherwise has no place to go really when you think yeah. about it where do they go yeah so i i i am a big proponent of this yeah huge and, proponent. and i think i mean my understanding is that in Florida, this is a it's a required. I'm not sure if it's required or if it's just available, but I think at at a bare minimum, it's available for every school district in the state of Florida. Um, that's pretty incredible. It is. Uh, and I know Lauren's really trying to get this um, to to be nationwide, uh, and she's had a lot of success getting it into other school districts in other states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think these are the kinds of things that if this is even on people's radar, we can start lobbying uh, with our uh, governments, what, with our state exactly governments and be I'm like, thinking, look, this right. curriculum is out here. It's excellent. Right. Um, why is this not in our schools? We have why is this not being taught? who are in our advocacy groups. We have teachers who are among right. our advocates. We have parents, you know, who are survivors of abuse, mm -hmm. abuse who would love to see this. And so... This is yeah. one thing where we need to get the ball rolling, I think, we, you know, sooner yeah. rather than later. Yeah. And I think I think if we, if we just keep putting it on our own radar and on the radar of um, some of our politicians um, and just lobby for it. And I, I know some people are turned off by that word, but. Um, no, that's how it's done. Right. You have yeah, to talk to your talk done. to your local representatives right. and be like, why are we not teaching this in our school district? Oh, I didn't even know this w right. was available. I, I didn't know this it's existed. On, uh, most school districts radar right mm -mm. now. But yeah, I mean that the and I'm kind of preaching to the choir here because I I know people who work in our governor's office um, who are doing advocacy work, who are creating 
programs and really good programs for instructing our kids in the schools, I don't even know if they're aware of this curriculum. Mm -hmm. So, and that's my, that's my bad. That's on me. Um, So this is a good reminder for me. So it's not me telling you guys or us telling you guys what to do. It's just a reminder. Like we need to keep putting this on our own radar because life gets busy. Um, Things happen. And then we blink and our kids are growing up and out of the house. Mm -hmm. Um, so and abuse continues to happen. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It, uh, abuse is not on hold right. at all. So while we might put certain topics or certain issues on hold, abuse continues to plow forward mm-hmm. at a, at a steady, steady, consistent yeah. rate, um, harming more and more children. Yeah. I always say the numbers are going in the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- that's not me being a pessimist. No. That's me reading and staying on top of current statistics um so when it comes to when it comes to abuse i mean we are losing this battle quickly i just read Um, several articles last evening at home about abuse and what covid has done how mm -hmm. how abuse has just skyrocketed which you and i have talked about on this podcast several times oh yeah Yeah. during this past year but it continues the, the cases continue to climb we don't have enough people uh, able to deal with all of it. And I think that's where this component of education could help so much. Mm-hmm. Because if our children became more aware of what could happen in the world of abuse, I believe we have enough children who use their brains and, and would care um, about themselves you know, to say, hey, I'm not going to let myself get in this mess. Well, uh, and each other. Sexting I mean, we don't. We're helping each other. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. we don't have a system that's really helpful or no. conducive to, to peers helping peers. Right. So, oh, you know, yeah. oftentimes, and I studied, I mean, for, for a while, um, I had studied cases of teacher on student abuse at, at schools. And, uh, you know, those are statistics, too, that are climbing mm. quickly in the wrong direction. Um, and I, you know, I started recognizing these trends as I was studying this and, and researching it and almost a hundred percent of the time, I mean, it was, it was probably, I don't have a, a, a number cause I didn't crunch the numbers, but I would say a, a minimum of 90% of the time, other students were fully aware that their peers were getting themselves into or being reeled into a situation that that was high risk and oftentimes the the peers recognized it as flat out abusive this teacher is abusing my friend mm-hmm. um but they didn't know what to and do and they with didn't that. know what to didn't do know where to they didn't go know who to that. tell right. they didn't know right how to intervene because they had never been trained to intervene um and i would say in probably 50% or more of these cases those peers could have stepped in and they could have stopped it before mm-hmm. these students were were fully abused I, I um, just by recognizing the signs and knowing how to intervene and that's staggering and stop it's it. mind-boggling jimmy when you think about it um because we need to do something to get tools out there to help mm-hmm. our children we do at at all ages and the traps are out there the, yeah. pe- the, the abusers are out there. Yeah, and I think um, I th- one yeah. of the criticisms um, that we hear is, you know, I've heard this before, like, you shouldn't ever put any um, uh, any of that uh, accountability or any of that pressure on a kid to be able to, to fend for themselves. I'm not advocating that kids right. be the ones who stop their abuser. Right. Um, I'm saying that we need a multi-layered approach where... You have very aware adults. They ought to be the first mm-hmm. people on the list who, who are able to intervene because right. they're the adults. Exactly. Um, it's our responsibility as parents, as teachers, as uh, as co-teachers, peers, whatever it is, it's our responsibility as adults to really be vigilant, to really be trained, and to have no excuses. There should be zero excuses um, for us to not be adequately trained. Um, so I want to put that out there. Uh, the second part of that is I'm all about putting tools in the tool belt um, 
to give people more creativity, more creative ways to to spot abuse, to stop abuse, to intervene. And that's through all ages. Um, mm -hmm. it, there is no checklist. I've had people want me to give no, them checklists yeah. and be like, hey, just yeah. tell me what to do to stop abuse. Mm -hmm. um, good Does luck it work with that. that way? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, abusers are incredibly dynamic. They adapt. They're chameleons. Um, they think on the fly. They they adapt really, really well to smart. any situation. They're Very incredibly smart, smart yes. and incredibly sophisticated. And that's just your average abuser. So having this checklist and saying, well, we went to a two-hour training. We're good to go. Well, we know how to recognize the signs of abuse. You are setting yourself up for a catastrophic disaster. Um, that's not how this works. So my method is giving... Um, not my method, but a method that I adopt is really equipping people with more tools in their tool belt so that they're adequately trained, uh, they're adequately informed, and that they can think through a process. Like, okay, this is happening to me now. I'm feeling uncomfortable. Um, what do I say? Who do I tell? You know, as I'm, I'm thinking back and I'm thinking out loud right now to school days, with your sisters, there was a certain teacher who they came home and said, he he stands behind the girls and he rubs their shoulders and looks down their mm -hmm. shirts. That was something all of us boys knew. That was what, when we were in his class, we knew he was a pervert. knowledge. But at the time, what did I do about it? Nothing. What did I know to do about it? Nothing. Yeah, and our students didn't what know. Did we were never trained. What did students know to do about it? We looked Nothing. away. Nothing. Yeah. It, did it make the girls uncomfortable? Absolutely. Did he do it repeatedly? Absolutely. There was another teacher who was a spy in the girls' locker room. Mm -hmm. And they said there he would stand there watching the girls undress, mm -hmm. watching the girls get ready to shower. What was done about it? Nothing, because nobody had the tools to right. know what to do. Yeah. So there was that horrible feeling of, hey, this is wrong. This is dead wrong. Well, the lack of training leaves people helpless. It leaves everybody helpless, uh, including bystanders. It, it, it leaves everybody with this big question mark, like, okay, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing things that, mm -hmm. that really are not right. You know, there's this... I, I this, guess we just bury it, you know? There's this weird thing that I think about a lot that I wish I had taught you kids. And it's a two-letter word, no. And I just wish I would have taught you kids that there is a time and place when it's okay to just scream with all your might, no, you know? Yeah. And when an abuser is rubbing your shoulders and looking down your shirt if you just turn your head and scream bloody murder no yeah and turn the tables on them and embarrass them and yes, embarrass them and they're going to stop when that person is staring in the locker room if 10 girls got together and got in his face and screamed no you will not do that that person guaranteed is not going to continue to do and that. And report it. In, you know, have right. have oh, yeah. a very oh, yes. clear yes. method but, of reporting that right. kind of stuff. But if we taught our, our young kids from an early age up that your body is special, that, you know, nobody gets to touch your body or to look at your mm -hmm. body in a, a wrong way or however we wanted to describe that, and they had full permission, whether it was in church, in Sunday school, in daycare, what to scream no. I think mm -hmm. that would be really a beginning point. Yeah. Just a first step. Yeah. I, I just wish that I had taught you kids that word, you know, that no matter who it is, if something like that is making you feel uncomfortable, go for it. Just scream yeah. and stop that person. Yeah. Right there. I mean there's stop good them. there is good training that's out there we just need to tap it we yeah. need to really take advantage of it and and lobby you know i'll say it again we need to lobby for this we need to talk to our politicians and be like look like maybe it's not lauren's kids maybe there's something else in your in your mm -hmm. state that's been developed right. that's phenomenal um it needs to be it needs to be good uh it needs to move beyond good touch bad touch it needs right, to be yeah. comprehensive 
It needs to be um, multi-layered. It needs to span all age groups. Um, there needs to be a very clear process. If you have to stop and think and be like, now, what's the process again for reporting? It's yeah. too confusing. Yeah. Go back, scrap it, mm -hmm. and rewrite it. A two-year-old, a three-year-old should be able to explain what the reporting process is if they I feel I really love the idea of that triangle, choosing the triangle. I think that is yeah. great. Um, children need to have that big three that they can go to mm -hmm. you know, when, when something's up. Um, love that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we've, we've got to start empowering our kids and we need to, mm -hmm. um, to really, again, have this multi-layered um, approach where adults are, are watching out for the kids. Uh, peers are looking out for their peers and uh, individuals are looking out for themselves. You know, all Absolutely. of those components have yeah. to be present yes. uh, or else it's not going to work. You know, it, it, it's not up to just the adults because no. that's something too. Like I've trained at churches before where they're like, you know, we only want the leaders to be here. And I'm like, then it's going to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, totally uh, there is, there yeah. is a portion where I'd be glad to talk to your leaders and just you know, zero right. in on the leaders, fully, mm -hmm. fully happy to do that. Right. Um, but if you're just training your church leaders and that's where, where it this stops, it. No, it it's going to fail. Yeah. You are going to yeah. fail to protect your kids, mm -hmm. period. Um, so it's got to be a multi-layered approach for if sure. If you had to pick a first step, Jimmy, what would the first step be? Uh, to find the, the, the right curriculum that's already out there. Okay. That'd be step number one. Um, because then otherwise go. otherwise you're going to be reinventing the wheel. Um, you're going to be wasting your time. Uh, and our time on this earth is valuable. Uh, we don't have much of it. Right. So um, find the people that already put the, the legwork in and um, find the curriculum that's out there or the training, whatever it is, that works and it works well. Um, it's out there. Um, and maybe it can be improved, but you don't At have to start from ground zero. We need a beginning point. We need yeah. a be yes, a first step, a beginning point uh, to begin equipping our kids properly. Yeah. yeah. So um, I guess we'll leave you with this truth bomb today. Um, if you are an able-bodied person, um, if you are an able-bodied parent or guardian, grandparent, uh, begin training in the home. Uh, if you're able to do it, start start with your kids, your grandkids, um, and find resources that, that work for you. Um, for the rest of you, or for all of us, really, uh, again, find the right curriculum that, that fits the right programs and start talking to, to your local representatives. And just Let's throw it the out there. Rolling. See if, yeah, see if you can get it. Get, start yeah. with your school district. Yes. Yes. Run a pilot program. And just say, let's just let's just try it and see where this works. Um, be bold. Don't be afraid to do it. The worst they can do is say no. We'll leave you with that. Uh, thank you for tuning into this episode. We'll catch you next round. Thanks again for listening to today's episode. Thank you to our patrons who make the podcast possible. If you found it helpful, please follow on Spreaker and search for the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast in your favorite podcast app. Be sure to hit subscribe and rate the show. If you believe in what we do, consider supporting the podcast by becoming a patron and check out the cool rewards our patrons receive. Share with your friends and tell the world. Join us in speaking out on sex abuse so we can change the tides and prevent abuse.